This is the fifth in a series of lectures on differential geometry. In the last lecture, we found a way to differentiate smooth maps. In this lecture, we want to ask whether a map from one manifold to another is embedding it as an embedded submanifold. And then we want to apply this condition to, uh, to the Grassmannian to actually embed it into Euclidean space. We start by asking when a map is actually going to be an embedding. Let's look at some examples. A very simple example is the map that takes a real number t to a point of the plane, say x of t, y of t in the plane given by uh, t squared and t cubed. We look at the image of this map. It's very easy to, 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 to draw it out. Um, it's, uh, it's given uh, by it, uh, some shape that looks a bit like this the sharp cusp here, and of course this part of it is the graph of y equals um, x to the 3 halves, and this is y equals minus x to the 3 halves, and they meet in a manner that's not obviously not a, not a, a submanifold. So it's too nasty to be a submanifold. That leads us to the first condition we'd want to have. Um, why is this messing up? What's going on badly here? Well, the derivative of this map is vanishing, in other words, it's a critical point, exactly when, when t equals 0, because when t equals 0, that's when the derivative of t squared is 0, and also when the derivative of t cubed is 0. So that's the problem. The rank of the map is dropping, because the derivative is going to 0. So that's something we're going to have to worry about. And so the first thing we want to, we want to do is to, is to insist on that sort of condition, an immersion is a smooth map. With injective derivative, injective as a linear map, um, and that isn't what's happening here because at t equals zero, the derivative of this map is actually as a linear map is just zero, so it's not injective. By the rank theorem, if we have an immersion, then um, from some p to some q, um, p here and say some three-dimensional q here. Um, then uh, whatever it looks like, um, it must be uh, there must be little pieces of of p uh, which get mapped into here so that it so that they're embedded. Little pieces of p get embedded, little open sets, um, because the the rank theorem tells us that the map is linear in um, in small enough open sets of p in some suitable charts. And a linear injective map, a linear map with injective differential, is uh, injective derivative, is in fact uh, is in fact injective, and of course is uh, is has image an embedded submanifold. It's embedded. There's another problem that's more or less obvious um, in the picture. Um, we could have a, a map that takes the say the open disk in the plane, and maps it in such a way that it actually wraps around itself. Uh, and touches itself uh, like this, overlapping. So, and and in fact, the explicit formulas for such maps are not that difficult to come up with. But I don't want to waste time on doing that. So you could have a map that looks like that. That would be an immersion, um, but not not one to one, not injective. So that's bad. So we're certainly going to want to work with injective immersions. So we might wonder if maybe an injective immersion is enough. Um, are injective immersions actually? Uh, good enough, be well enough behaved uh, to have uh, em to be embeddings to to have image in an embedded submanifold, and that's a more sophisticated issue. So we need a more sophisticated counterexample. Uh, what we're going to do is to imagine a particle that moves in the plane. The particle sits here, and then as time goes on, it moves over this way, and then it as it goes on for a while it decides it never crosses its path. Its path will never cross itself, so it's an injective map. Okay, so we want to make this particle slide along in such a way that it never touches any point it's ever been at, been to before, so, uh, so that it's an injective map. But it will come very, very close to, and it'll gradually slow down and get slower and slower and slower and asymptotically approach a point it's already been at. Um, so that's bad because if you, so in this case again, this would be a smooth map where P is the real number line and we trace out and Q is going to be the plane 
and in the plane we draw this this curve. We imagine this particle is at, this is uh, the real number line, and of course we think of it as being the t number line, and this is the x and the y, and this is some path x of t, y of t, injectively an immersed uh, map. So derivatives are never never vanishing. In other words, the velocity is never zero. So the thing keeps moving with non-zero velocity, but getting slower and slower and slower and sliding in toward this in this direction toward this point it's already been at. That means that if you try to take a little tiny uh, microscopic picture of this thing, you'd see something that looks like almost like a straight line going this way, and you'd see all something coming in this way. And so what it really looks like the image actually looks like a like a T. Um, so it can't be, in, no matter how small a little picture you take around here, I draw this tiny little picture and it looks like this, um, the image of this map, no matter how small a, an open set you draw, doesn't look like a nice curve. It looks always like a T. It always doesn't, it always looks nastier than what we want to allow as, a, as an embedded submanifold. So an embedded submanifold should get smooth, being smooth should get closer and closer to being just a straight line as you get closer and closer to it. But this thing, as you zoom in on it, doesn't start looking like a, a flat uh, a flat thing, like a straight line. So it's definitely not an embedded submanifold. That's the most sophisticated example um, that we want to come up with. So um, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with these examples? This example, well, we've already said injective and immersed are the conditions we needed. What about this one? This isn't a proper map. A proper map, remember, is... Um, proper uh, maps called proper if um, if uh, pre images uh, phi inverse k of compact sets k are compact so that's the definition of proper and it's a topological term it doesn't have anything to do with manifolds um, so what we want to do is to say that the right term uh, the right uh, kind of map we want to work with is a proper injective immersion so that's the the next uh, result, um, which says that um, we have a proper injective immersion, we're okay. So, uh, so if we take a, let's say, um, a lemma, if uh, phi takes p to q, smooth, um, a proper injective immersion then um, uh, let's let S be the image, 5P. Uh, the image is an embedded, is an embedded submanifold. Of Q, so its image is embedded and um, phi takes P to S is, is a diffeomorphism. So its image is embedded, and it's a diffeomorphism to its image. Okay, and, and that wouldn't happen with that fancy example we just saw. Um, so the proof involves a little bit of topology, which I won't I won't give uh, from from a topology class. You'd already know if you uh, don't know. That's fine. Uh, it's in the topology textbooks that um, a proper injective uh, uh, continuous map. Um, from a uh, topological space to a to a locally compact Hausdorff space, and that'll include a fuzzy manifolds are included in that, um, uh, is a homeomorphism to its image. Okay, and, and obviously that's not, not something I'd expect you to, to have at the top of your, off the top of your head to remember why that's true, or even maybe to have even seen it. But it's certainly covered in the standard topology textbook, so not something we want to we want to spend time on here. Um, so that means, therefore, that this map phi t takes p to s is a homeomorphism. Okay, so we've got that. Um, now what we want to do is we want to take a point p naught at p, and then to s naught is phi of p naught. Or perhaps we should go the other way around. Start with an arbitrary point s naught and s. Since a homeomorphism doesn't really matter, we can go back to the p naught point in there, and then um, we can use the rank theorem. Uh, it tells us that uh, that there are coordinates, uh, there are charts um, on p near p naught and on q near q naught, which is of course the image of 
um, well, Q0 is, of course, just S0. It's the image point there. Um, uh, so that uh, uh, phi becomes linear. Uh, linear and being having an injective um, injective derivative, it must therefore be a um, a linear embedding uh, on of of some open set in Q to a P is some open set in Q. Um, so uh, so embeds some open uh, subset of P near P naught near P naught, but that's okay because if we wanted to work with a point S naught and S not a P and other than P naught and P, um, then we just um, we just have that this is uh, well S, a P to S uh, phi is a homeomorphism, and so we can take uh, so um, take uh, the corresponding open set of S. So we have an open set of P where this maps an embedding, but then this maps homeomorphism, so the corresponding image is an open set in S in which the map is, is, is an embedding. And so that embeds that piece of S, and that works at any, any point of S, so every point of S is uh, is locally embedded. And so that's the proof. It's not very long, but um, it does establish a, a, a fairly tricky result. As, as a nice simple example of applying this result, we could look at um, at the um, following map, uh, phi of x, y, uh, z is x squared minus y squared, x squared minus z squared, x, y, x, z, y, z, for instance, oops, off the screen. Okay, so uh, so that, that map is, of course, defined as a map taking r3 to r, what is that, 5. Um, Right, one, two, three, four, five. So, uh, so R, R three to R five, um, and uh, and it's not very well behaved. Its derivatives are, uh, drops rank at the origin, uh, for example. But it is uh, possible to show that it's not. It's an immersion. It's an immersion um, on not on all of R three, but R three minus the origin. Just cut out the origin, and then it's fine. And then uh, the other thing that's striking about it is that um, if you plug in negative x, negative y, negative z, you change the sign on x, that gets squared, it gets squared, they're all quadratic. And so because they're quadratic, they multiply sign changes together. And so you end up with a um, with a, a sign change in every term, with no sign changes in it at all in every every term. So uh, you get the same the same result, uh, phi of minus x minus y minus z is phi of x, y, z. So this thing is immersing R3 but it's not embedding R3. What it's doing is it's actually embedding R3, but you have to quotient out by this guy. In particular, if we look at the two-sphere, um, S2 containing R3, the two-dimensional sphere, again, we said before that the traditional notation is a bit strange. S2 doesn't mean S cross S. It just simply means the two-dimensional sphere in R3. Um, then uh, this, the map phi, when restricted to S2, takes S2, to R5 is an immersion, but it's not an injective immersion because of this property. It's 2 to 1. And you can check it's exactly 2 to 1. Um, so it's 2 to 1. Um, and, and therefore, it actually drops to be defined, uh, drops to the real projective plane, which recall was the sphere modulo um, that h vector x is identified with minus x. If you quotient out, in other words, by the action of the group that, uh, if you like, S2 modulo, the action of the group plus and minus 1 that switches each element with its negative. So the north pole and the south pole get identified in this this uh, this sphere uh, mapping down to this RP2. So this real projective plane then um, uh, has uh, each point, um, the, the opposite points identified, but this map uh, does the same thing on opposite points, and so not surprisingly, it actually drops to be defined as a map to RP2, and then it's an injective immersion uh, to R5, and of course it's um, it's uh, proper because this is compact, um, which uh, I think is one of the exercises for you to show that projective spaces are compact. So that gives you an embedding of, of the real projective plane. We don't know how to embed it in R3. Well, we've said it can't be embedded in a three-dimensional Euclidean space, but there it is in five. Now. Um, 
as always, we really want to think about how to relate uh, e examples in differential geometry and examples in linear algebra. We really like linear algebra, so we're going to try to understand some more linear algebra and try to embed the Grismanian. Um, we're going to think about uh, what are called idempotent isometries. Um, so we take a, uh, an idempotent map, an idempotent linear map, uh, on a vector space, that means a map, uh, let's call it G, I call it, I'm calling it G because I think of it as a of a group of linear maps, the group of invertible linear maps. Um, so it's going to be uh, this guy so that G squared, when you do it twice, in other words, G composed G is the identity. It's called idempotent. And um, uh, so it's not hard to, to prove using linear algebra that such a, such a, such a linear map, you can think of it as a matrix, this G, um, so even though it's a small letter, it's actually sort of it's actually like a matrix. Um, so a linear map uh, whose square is the identity. In other words, you do it twice and you get the identity of the linear map. Um, this guy then its eigenvalues will uh, will split it and split into two eigenspaces. It'll have an uh, uh, one eigenspace, an eigenspace with eigenvalue one, and a minus one eigenspace. And then um, it'll uh, actually split the vector space into two. Um, so um, as a direct sum of those two eigenspaces, which I'll leave you to check with some linear algebra. Um, so then uh, what we're going to think about aren't just uh, idempotent maps, but isometries. So we'll assume that V uh, has, a, uh, has an inner product, it's an inner product space. In other words, has a positive definite inner product. So we could assume it's just Euclidean space with the usual inner product. Um, so now what we're going to do is to, to look at isometry. So isometries. Um, a linear isometry is, of course, a linear map uh, taking V to V and preserving distances, or in other words, preserving the products. And geometrically, that's the same as preserving distances. And so we're interested in idempotent isometries, that is to say, uh, isometric maps whose square is the identity. Where would those come from? If we were to take a um, if we were to take uh, P containing V, a linear subspace, uh, and then we were to look at, uh, at at its perpendicular space because it's an inner product space, we have an inner, uh, perpendicular. We could uh, we could construct a unique linear map, uh, idempotent isometry, by the saying that this guy should be equal to the identity on P and equal to minus the identity on perpendicular to P. So it preserves all the vectors in P, it reflects across it, or across P, all the vectors perpendicular. So somehow here's P, and then here's P perp. And then what you do is any vector that's in here gets flipped to its negative, but any vector in here stays exactly where it is under GP. That's a, an idempotent isometry. And uh, conversely, uh, so it's easy linear algebra to, to check that, that there is such an idempotent isometry. It's unique, and conversely, every uh, idempotent isometry arises this way uniquely for a unique P. Um, so that's where they come from. And so what we want to do is very simply, we want to say that to each P, we associate the idempotent isometry, which is identity on P minus identity on P perp. And that should be a map, which hopefully is an injective, um, an injective map that will associate to each element of the Grismanian, the Grismanian, um, should associate some idempotent isometry in the space of idempotent isometries. It'll be relevant for us to know that the Grassmannian is, is compact. Uh, we know the Grassmannian is a manifold. Um, it's a smooth manifold. We even know its dimension. But um, of P, that's my p-dimensional subspaces in V, um, its dimension is P times dimension V minus P. Um, but uh, we also know, well, we, I, I'm going to say it's compact, and that's an exercise for you to try. Um, or if there's arguments for that in the, I think there's more than one argument in the lecture notes that explain why that's true. So, uh, so I'll leave that for you to check. Um, so now what I want to do is to define what's called the Cartan embedding. Um, if uh, you're, we're going to pick, for once and for all, uh, one particular subspace, sorry, uh, one particular subspace, p-dimensional. A linear subspace, uh, 
And then the Cartan embedding is defined as follows. Um, it's the map, uh, let's call it, I don't know, capital V, taking the Grismanian to uh, the space of, 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 uh, of isometries, um, to, which is the orthogonal group on uh, n, n, if n is the dimension of V. Um, and V is, let's say, Rn with its usual inner product. It'll take the Grismanian to the orthogonal transformations of the vector space V by uh, phi of uh, linear subspace P is, in fact, going to be GP, GP naught. So we picked a particular P naught to start with. It's, this is the, the way Cartan wrote it down, so more or less. So this is the, 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 one, the, the map that he wrote down. So that's what one, the one we want to take a look at. And um, what we want to claim is that... Uh, the Cartan embedding is an embedding. No, so this is the Cartan. It's called the Cartan embedding. And um, the Cartan embedding uh, is a is a smooth uh, embedding. In other words, it smoothly embeds. Um, it has embedded image. Uh, the diffeomorphism to its image, which is an embedded submanifold. It's a smooth embedding of uh, that Grassmannian to the um, to the uh, orthogonal group. Okay. Um, in particular, it makes the uh, the Grassmannian. Uh, into this compact and it turns out connected manifold um, inside, sitting inside the um, sitting inside the Grisman or the, uh, the the orthogonal group. So in order to prove this, we really want to write it out in terms of our charts. We recall that our charts on the Grismanian were defined by writing um, so something of a proof, um, at least an outline of a proof. Our charts were defined by writing each subspace as y equals ax for some uh, variables, x's and y's, which are linear variables, some a linear isomorphism or a space with the Euclidean uh, space split into these x's and y's. So um, so that's our chart. And then uh, I'll leave you to check that if you, um, if you let h be the matrix, i plus a transpose a inverse, and then you let G, uh, then, well, then in fact, GP can be explicitly calculated as 2 times H, H, A transpose, A, H, A, H, A transpose, minus the identity matrix. So, um, not very interesting, but you can do enough, if you just do a bit of linear algebra, work out the details, how do you write, for this linear subspace, how do you write the reflection or the, across the perpendicular and the identity map on, on, on the subspace itself? So I won't do uh, all that linear algebra. I'll just say that it's not hard to prove that this is the answer. It's a bit messy, but that is the answer. Um, and that means we can then calculate the derivative at least at a equals 0. Um, so derivative, at, let's say, at a equals 0, gp prime of a, we can explicitly calculate out well, at, I'm sorry, I should say, when I say at a equals 0, we should say if we let p naught be y equals 0, then we should say g p naught prime at uh, g, g p prime, carton prime at p naught applied to the uh, the tangent vector given by some, some b in the chart, so b matrix, um, uh, which is, of course, the derivative of g at y equals uh, tb, um, ddt at t equals 0. Um, this uh, 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 idempotent isometry we can calculate out by plugging into this horrible mess formula and get that it's exactly given by uh, this uh, unpleasant uh, mess uh, turns out to be uh, 2 times 0 b transpose b0. So these are uh, expressions I don't expect you to see why they're true immediately. I'm, I'm claiming that if you went through the linear algebra to try and figure out what is the is the operation that reflects across p and p, the, the p perp vectors and leaves the p vectors alone um, for this linear subspace, I'm claiming you could calculate it as this one. It's just a bit messy. So it's quite a messy computation to check all that. 
but then you can differentiate this this guy as you move the subspace um, near the zero subspace, the A is zero subspace, you can calculate this guy. You actually get a simple expression for the derivative. Um, in particular, um, it's, in, it's injective because B represents the derivative, represents in the chart uh, the velocity of this changing subspace. Remember that, that the subspace is in the chart is given by y equals ax, the chart is phi of p is a. So the matrix A is representing p in the chart, and as we move the matrix A, as, as, a, as a, a equals TB, we're moving it along a curve um, in the in the space of matrices, and then its derivative, its velocity is B, and then this is the uh, representation of the um, of the derivative of of the map GP uh, differentiated as so we move along this curve uh, with velocity given by B in the chart. And there you can see b sitting right there in the in the velocity vector, and so this is in fact uh, an injective uh, a linear map, and so p maps to g p is in fact uh, an immersion. It's smooth because it can give it explicitly by these formulas that only involve matrix arithmetic. So of course you have to know that things like transposing and inversing are are are, are smooth where they're defined, which I'll leave you to think about. Um, it's not at all strange or surprising. So we can calculate out explicitly what the derivative is. So it's actually not so bad. Um, we have again we have a chart which is taking each. Once again we have this p given by this formula y equals ax. So the chart was to associate uh, p a. And then we move a along an arbitrary vector, a equals tb, on an arbitrary, with an arbitrary velocity through, through the origin. And that gives us a, a curve in the space of matrices, and that, uh, by, the, uh, by reversing the process of the chart, gives us a curve in the space of, of linear subspaces in the Grassmannian. So this is our curve in the Grassmannian. And we differentiate it, and we found its velocity is given by this. And that's injective because the derivative is represented in the chart by the value of this b, and so that means that we've actually got an, an injective immersion. So we've got an immersed map, and um, and uh, it, oh, I should say also that p goes to g p is easy to seem to be injective as a map, uh, just uh, without worrying about derivatives. Um, you take a linear subspace p and map it to g p, it's injective, and the reason why uh, is is just linear algebra. Uh, applied to, you know, constructing this GP out of this P there, there that um, uniquely determines P because it's the subspace on which the G is the identity. So that makes that injective. This has an injective differential, which is a bit ugly to calculate, but in principle you can do it. And so, in fact, that implies that the Cartan embedding, which is P goes to not GP, but GP, GP naught, is therefore also, uh, is also an immersion. Um, it's not hard to see because multiplying by GP can be undone by multiplying by its inverse, and so that's um, that's got to be a diffeomorphism. So now we uh, we finally have that this is an injective immersion, and uh, but that's only it's only injective actually. We we only check this injective near the subspace where a is zero. We only pick protection one particular subspace. But that's okay because we could chick, pick our, our chart to make it be that be that be the subspace we want. And any subspace can become the subspace y equals zero by a suitable choice of coordinates x's and y's. If we set up the whole thing on an abstract vector space, we get to pick a basis. When you pick a basis, you can arrange your, your chosen subspace to be given by y is zero, and you can differentiate around that chosen subspace, say p naught. That's the subspace y is zero. So this works at any, in fact, at any subspace. So it's always going to calculate out that this guy has is an immersion, and therefore this guy is also an immersion. So we have an injective immersion, and um, as you said, the the Grismanian is compact. Again, that's for you to prove. And so um, so we have an injective immersion. Uh, this Cartan uh, and this Cartan map phi is an injective immersion from this guy to um, to the orthogonal group. Okay, and so by uh, by our theorem pre previously, it's actually therefore an embedding. Um, okay, so that embeds the Grassmannian. There are, of course, a few little details left out about how exactly you calculate all these unpleasant bits of linear algebra, but I'll leave you to check that stuff, and it's done in the notes. That's fairly heavy stuff, um, but it's all we have for, for this lecture. Um, so 
you can hopefully uh, absorb it by trying some of the problems from the from the, the lecture notes. Um, and next time we'll talk about, uh, so far we've really just talked about individual vectors and differentiating by trying to send a velocity vector in one manifold to a velocity vector in the other manifold by a smooth map. Um, but what if we don't have just a single moving particle, what if we have sort of a whole uh, fluid flow? Um, we want to imagine that kind of picture as well. Uh, so that's uh, well, what we'll study next time, the theory of uh, vector fields on manifolds.